with uh, Rick, uh, who's going to speak for 10 to 15 minutes, and then Jeff will respond for 10 to 15 minutes, and then Rick will have a, a rebuttal, and then Jeff may or may not have a rejoinder, and uh, we will open it up to questions. Uh, you have to flip your mic on uh, to speak, and then turn it off when you're done speaking. Well, hopefully this mic is on. I can't. Nope. Um, so first of all, thanks very much to uh, Michael and the Brennan Center, uh, not just for putting this event together, but for uh, extracting this essay from me, uh, which uh, would not exist but for their concerted efforts to, uh, to push it all the way through. Um, and I want to thank the Century Foundation also for uh, committing to the volume and putting it out in such, on such short notice. Um, there was a special pleasure for me in coming to do this tonight that I hadn't anticipated, which is, um, for those of you who know my, my friend and colleague Sam Zakharov, he mostly spends his time giving me a hard time. And I've actually rarely been in the role where he's had to introduce me. <laughs> and so I have never heard him say such flattering things. Um, and I'll stipulate that any time you can arrange to have Sam have to introduce me, I'd be happy to appear at these events. Um, I, I wanted to give you a sort of general framework for thinking about how the First Amendment should apply to the context of democratic elections, which includes the specific issue of corporate speech in the election context, but is somewhat more general than that. Um, and I start from what is a common assumption, I think, about uh, among many people, um, including legally educated people, about the First Amendment, which is that there is some general set of First Amendment principles or doctrines or rules that apply across the board anytime the government regulates something that might justifiably be considered speech. And this general set of First Amendment principles includes the familiar doctrinal elements of no viewpoint discrimination, government can't distinguish uh, among speech or speakers based on the identity of speaker, uh, that more speech is always better than less speech. And I call this general conception of the First Amendment the sort of off-the-rack uh, conception, by which I mean that a lot of people assume that courts kind of take this conception of the First Amendment off the rack and apply it to specific problems in the speech area as they arise. And my starting point is the suggestion that this general conception is overstated, say it's wrong, it's, it's too broadly put, uh, that it does apply in some domain of First Amendment issues, but not nearly as broadly as a lot of people tend to think. And just descriptively, as a matter of existing First Amendment doctrine, the First Amendment is already much more institution specific than this general kind of off the rack conception of the First Amendment would suggest. So the Supreme Court doctrine already recognizes a variety of institutional contexts or settings or spaces in which the general principles of the First Amendment don't apply, even though the government is regulating speech. And my argument is that election should be understood as another one of these institutional contexts that ought to be understood as requiring a different way of understanding the First Amendment than the sort of general off-the-rack vision um, would suggest. Uh, and let me start with some examples of how the court already recognizes a much more institutionally specific First Amendment than this general view would suggest and then apply this to the sphere of elections. So I could give you a number of examples, but public schools are one area. Uh, where the court recognizes that the First Amendment doesn't apply in the way which it would apply in the general sphere of public debate. Government ordinarily can't prohibit you from talking about politics, but obviously public school teachers can prohibit students from talking about politics in classrooms where it's inappropriate or inconsistent with the educational mission of the class. Uh, public employment is another setting where the court has long recognized that government can't function efficiently and effectively if government employees have the same kinds of speech rights that citizens have in the general arena of public debate. 
And there are lots of other examples like this in which the court has recognized an institutionally specific First Amendment. There are distinct rules for, uh, for speech on government property that don't apply in the same way to speech on private property. Uh, speech in prisons and military settings, a lot of different institutional environments in which the court accepts a variety of things like viewpoint discrimination or distinctions based on the identity of the speaker. And what unites all of these examples, in my view, is a kind of core idea that certain institutions are set up to achieve a particular set of purposes and functions, and that it would be inconsistent with those purposes and functions to apply the First Amendment in the sort of general off-the-rack vision or way. Um, that the First Amendment has to be reconciled in some way with the purposes and functions of these distinct institutional settings. And it's not that we ask when a public school teacher says, you know, shut up, you're disrupting the class, that that has to be justified by some strict scrutiny kind of analysis. The analysis is much more straightforward, that it's fundamentally inconsistent with the purposes of the classroom to allow sort of, you know, robust, uninhibited, wide open public debate. Um, now the claim of, of what I call electoral exceptionalism is that elections should be seen as a similarly <laughs> specific and distinct institutional context in a democracy. That elections are designed and organized to achieve a specific set of purposes and functions and that distinguishes them, it differentiates the sphere of elections from the general sphere of public debate, uh, the general sphere of politics and policy argument. Uh, and that, in fact, Supreme Court doctrine already recognizes this about elections. This is not a radical uh, proposal for something dramatically at odds with existing First Amendment practice. So government, of course, heavily regulates the electoral process in a variety of ways, including imposing restrictions that could be seen as viewpoint or speech-based restrictions. It regulates what's on the ballot, how you get on the ballot, what can be said on the ballot, what can be said around polling places. It regulates the structure of public debates between candidates when they're sponsored by public institutions. And of course, for 100 <laughs> years, government has regulated uh, certain actors, corporations and unions, uh, and prohibited them from contributing money directly to federal candidates, even though the Supreme Court recognizes there is a First Amendment speech interest in contributing money in general. But although it would be unconstitutional to ban citizens from contributing anything to candidates, it's been accepted uh, since 1907 that government can ban corporations and unions from contributing money to candidates. Now, none of these existing regulations would be permissible if the courts applied the general off-the-rack <laughs> conception of the First Amendment. So how does this idea apply to the specific issue of Citizens United uh, or the question of corporate spending uh, on elections? Um, we have to start with some understanding of what the purposes and the functions of elections in a democracy are. And of course, elections serve many different kinds of purposes. Um, but surely one of those purposes is to create a mechanism for choosing a legitimate set of government officials who are going to exercise the coercive power of the state, but in a way that is sort of widely accepted as essentially legitimate, uh, as a legitimate form of government self-rule. Um, and to take an extreme example, if corporate spending on elections or any other practice uh, alienated citizens sufficiently so that turnout in elections fell to let's say 15 or 20 percent uh, and this basic function of elections and of empowering a legitimate government was seriously compromised it's hard for me to understand how the First Amendment could stand in the way of government responding to that fact by responding to the sources of that alienation or disaffection or withdrawal from political participation. If, if corporate spending or other kinds of spending in the election context undermines this core purpose of elections, then I would suggest the First Amendment ought to have to be reconciled with the social functions and purposes of elections in a way in which the court has long recognized 
that the First Amendment has to be reconciled with the purposes of educational institutions or public employment or schools or prisons or other kinds of distinct institutional spaces. Now, obviously we're not at that point empirically in terms of the effect of uh, spending on elections, uh, but of course Citizens United has just been decided. Um, but when we have a political debate in which the Congress of the United States uh, responding <laughs> to concerns like this uh, makes a decision like the decision to extend the ban on corporate contributions to a ban on corporate spending on electoral activity that is thought to create the same kinds of risks that the original ban on corporate contributions created. Um, why should the general off the rack conception of the First Amendment be applied without regard to some assessment of what role elections are supposed to play, what the point of elections is in a democracy, and whether these kinds of restrictions are in fact consistent with the purposes for which elections are uh, organized. Now I don't think you see much attention to those kinds of thoughts, perspectives, uh, and framework for thinking about these issues in the Citizens United opinion, because I think what you largely see is an application off of the off-the-rack conception, so that the court recites all of the standard elements of the general vision of the First Amendment. You know, Congress can't regulate based on the identity of the speaker, uh, and these sorts of uh, thoughts. So, you know, my suggestion is that one of the most effective ways of thinking about regulation of the electoral process, not just the corporate spending issue, but for thinking about the First Amendment's relationship to democratic elections more generally, is that we need to think, as the court has in some context, about elections as a distinct sphere of activity, organized for specific kinds of purposes and functions, uh, and regulations that are consistent with those purposes, that further those purposes, that are adequately justified, um, should be seen as consistent with this vision of integrating the First Amendment with the distinct institutions of American democracy and not sort of fundamentally at odds with the American First Amendment tradition. That's the end.